Hello, Ecotopians. Today we're studying community ecology in Ecotopia and everywhere else. And uh, ecology puts everything together. So I'm kind of excited about this particular subject area and because it helps us put things together. And we've been studying a lot of different things and they're coming together in ecology. So uh, let's talk about it. I'm putting right up front all the vocabulary that I want you to learn uh, in today's presentation. Uh, I want you to know these words, ecology and biological species concept, morphological species concept, population, there's two different definitions, biotic community, habitat, and ecosystem. I will, as usual, post these in a separate file, a word file uh, that that uh, is there for you to use. What I would do is I would open that up and I would add my own definition and descriptive information to it to help me learn what those words mean. It's there just for you if you want to use it. And I am also including these concepts here, what cycles and what flows through ecosystems and the chemical macronutrients, photosynthesis and respiration. These are things we've been talking about already. I just want to emphasize them again and again because I believe that an understanding of these things and an awareness of these things really helps us understand what's going on around us. Okay, so what we're going to do today is just take these words one at a time and uh, line them up and knock them down. So, ecology is the scientific study of interactions among organisms and their environment. And, uh, okay, so it's a science. Uh, one thing I would advise you to understand is that in the world outside, people often mistake the word ecology for radical environmentalist. And that is a great misunderstanding. Ecology is a science. It's a science like botany or physics um, or chemistry or sociology. It is a science. It is not a political stance. It may be true or it may not be true that a lot of people who are ecologists may also be environmentalists, but those two things are not necessarily linked together. Okay, so make sure you understand that. Now understand what it really is. It's a scientific study of interactions between organisms and their environment. That's what it's all about. Okay, so for examples, what do we have here? Oh, here's a great example. Okay, so this is a riparian habitat. Riparian habitat, we'll get to that later, um, is wet areas. And these trees here are alder trees, red alder. That's what we have here in the Pacific Northwest. And the Latin for that is Alnus rubra. And uh, you can see here's some leaves of them. They're kind of fairly simple leaves with dentate margins. And uh, they have these uh, female and male catkins. These are the male catkins. They're actually flowers giving off pollen. And over here is uh, young female catkins, which are, they're not cones, but they look a lot like cones. They're basically packs of seeds. And this tree is very common in our area in riparian zones. And uh, I haven't said a thing yet about interactions. So we haven't talked about the ecology of alder yet but I'm going to now. So what kind of interactions does alder have? Well, it's a big tree. It's doing photosynthesis, and so it is interacting with the atmosphere. It is a riparian plant, and so yes, it drinks a lot of water through its roots, but it also stabilizes the banks of rivers and hillsides that are wet by its roots. And so by stabilizing that, it maintains soil and keeps soil from being lost when floods come. Cool. So by preventing soil loss, it increases the amount of soil in the area, which is good for all sorts of other organisms. Uh, let's see, what else does it do? Oh, by slowing down the floodwaters that come by here, it allows the floodwaters then to drop out heavier soil particles that might be washed away, like gravel and sand and silt. So it's preventing erosion, and it may even be gathering soil along the banks of streams over time. I wanted to say something more specific. Well, up in the trees there will be birds and there will be insects, and so there's all kinds of interactions between this plant and herbivores and other things. But I wanted to say something about the below ground, which uh, relates to this paper here that somebody named J.F. Murphy and O.K. Miller published a long time ago um, that has to do with uh, the roots of a, a sibling of Ulnus rubra, Ulnus serrulata. This is an East Coast alder. And what I did with my boss was to look at the interactions of fungi on the roots of this organism. And it's 
pretty fascinating. I'd love to talk about it for a long time. In a nutshell, this plant has a mutualistic relationship, a type of symbiosis, with fungi. Uh, and the, what the fungi do is they gather phosphates and nitrates, mostly phosphates and some nitrates, uh, from the soil, and they deliver it to the hungry tree. And that helps the tree thrive. In return, the tree gives the fungus photosynthate, that is, the sugars derived from photosynthesis. Because the poor fungi can't eat food, they can't do photosynthesis, and instead of decomposing stuff, they have this relationship with the tree, the tree feeds them, which is a great mutualism. But it gets even more complicated because there is a third member of this mutualism. It's a bacterium called Frankia. And this Frankia is a nitrogen fixer. Remember what that means? It takes the nitrogen gas out of the atmosphere and turns it into a usable form. So the tree is getting nitrate from the bacteria that live in little nodules on the roots. And the tree is getting um, phosphate or phosphorus from the fungus. And the fungus and the bacteria are both getting photosynthate from the tree. Pretty cool. That's ecology. That is interactions among organisms. That's what that is. Okay, so that's my example of uh, ecology. All right, next item on our list is species. Probably everybody knows what species is in a vague sort of sense, but I'm going to break it down to you in two different definitions. One is the biological species concept. That is, a bunch of organisms in nature that can interbreed, that can interbreed in nature. Just because you put them in a fish tank and they breed doesn't necessarily mean that they're biological species because if they never meet in nature then they're not a biological species. Uh, which is a kind of complicated concept but breeding is the main point here. If they can breed, uh, if they can interbreed then they are members of one biological species. If they can't interbreed then they are not the same species. They get a different name. The other concept is what's called the morphological species concept, a species concept based on a defined anatomical form. All right, what does that mean? It means that if it looks like a species, then it is a species, okay? It's just based upon appearance. Morpho means form, morphological, the study of the form um, gives us our species concept, okay? So it turns out that some morpho species in nature, I'm thinking of fungi, but probably other things as well, uh, may actually be composed of multiple biological species. Oyster mushrooms, maybe you know them. Oyster mushrooms turn out there's a lot of different oyster mushrooms and they look almost identical that do not interbreed. And so they are distinct biological species, but uh, they appear to be one morphological species. Okay, so. I will just simply add before moving on is that, uh, well, I'll give you examples of these, but I wanted to say that I'm not saying biological species are, I'm saying they are a concept. It turns out that the, the, uh, that the, the term species is a human concept. It's in nature, often the very fuzzy edges, not distinct boundaries between species. So I'll give you an example. Here's some examples of biological species. Good biological species. Horses, camels, uh, I guess that's a yama. They uh, do not interbreed. They are distinct biological species. These guys, even if you do put them in a pen together, will not breed and will not give you viable offspring. So they're good biological species. But you probably know about this little problem, that um, this is a donkey and this is a horse, a uh, different morphological species, but they can breed, kind of. Um, they can mate and have a baby, and so that's kind of like breeding. Their offspring is called a mule, but mules are sterile. So for some weird reason, um, their offspring can't breed. So that means that the, the, the distinction between these two species is a little bit blurry, okay, as a, as a biological species. Morphologically, almost everyone can tell a difference between a, a horse and an ass, so um, that's not a problem. So that's just the way nature works. It's it's complicated sometimes. Morphological species. Here's a, I just 
quickly Googled monarch butterfly mimics. And what I got was one, two, three different species that look like a monarch butterfly. If you look very closely, and the butterflyologists, lepidopterists, do, they look very closely at things. And when they find some um, differences that persist, then those are, they give them different names, morphological species. Now, do these morphological species breed in nature? Probably not. Usually not. Maybe they don't. Do we know if they're biological species or not? Very often we don't because who can take the time to take these little guys into the lab breed and, and raise them up from nature and see if they'll breed with each other? That is not an easy thing to do. And so um, we have millions of species out there, many that have not been named. And we uh, so far have not had the time to do the breeding experiment and experiments on every single one of them. So largely biologists rely on morphological species, although we know that there's better ways to really understand the differences between organisms. But we'll just leave that for your next biology class and move on. Okay, the next, uh, uh, the next word on our list is population. Now here's another problematic word. The word ecology was problematic because people think it means radical environmentalists when it doesn't. The word population is difficult because people think you mean population size. The population of Humboldt County is 135,000. Well, that is not the definition that I want you to know. I want you to know that a population is different from our use of population size. So what do I mean by population? Okay. A population to a biologist or an ecologist is the interbreeding group in a specific area. Oh, okay. The interbreeding group in a specific area. Okay. Oh, now we have a geographic component to interbreeding. Before, all the potentially interbreeding things were a species, but the ones in a particular area are called a population. Okay. Let's do some imagination. Here is the uh, Hawaiian Islands, and you can see Hawaii over here and its associated islands. And let's just imagine there's a species, some kind of bird that can uh, cross the ocean, or at least a little ways, but maybe not too far, and interbreed with the guys over there. So, you know, all the birds within this circled area are freely interbreeding as long as they are, are flying around. Okay, but you can probably imagine another species that can't fly so well, maybe some a uh, bird that really likes deep forest, and so it does not like to go out onto the beach and does not like to cross the ocean because that's dangerous. So they only stay in deep in the forest where they're safe. Now, maybe every so often there's a big storm or something, or maybe someone gets a wild hare and decides to leave or gets chased out, and so some migrants make it across every now and then, but not very often, where they might establish a new interbreeding group. Well, in that case, we might have a situation like this, where all the birds on the Big Island are an interbreeding group, a distinct population, and all the birds on these islands are another population, and so on and so forth. And we can make that even more. Let's say there's worms, some species of worm that never crosses the island, and maybe only, who knows how it got from here to there. There was a, a giant asteroid hit this island or an explosion, and five worms landed splat here 10,000 years ago, whatever. You can imagine that you might have some species that has a population structure that looks like this. Lots of populations. They are potentially interbreeding, but they rarely or never do, so they're new now lots of populations. Okay? So that's an imaginary experiment. I just wanted to show you a real life ex, uh, experiment that I have experience with. Um, let's go to Google Earth. Here we are. We're in North America. I want to take you down to a little uh, valley that I used to live in um, on the east side of the Sierras. Here's the central valley of California. Here are the Sierras with their snowy cap peak, and it gets dry on the other side. And if you zoom in, this is a um, death valley over here. And then there are these forgotten valleys and mountains over here. And here's the little valley I used to live in. It's called Deep Springs Valley. And in the um, one end of it is a playa. And uh, let's see, get fancy here. I am going to come in and I'm going to tilt the view because it's so cool. And I am going to look up into the mountains. So now you can see the mountains in the dif distance 
and this cool playa down here. A playa is a seasonally dry lake. I want to look at it from the other direction because these mountains are pretty cool. We'll actually come back and look across the valley at these sand dunes later. But for the time being, in this playa, you will see that there are these green areas, which are springs that are popping up from the base of these mountains because there's a big earthquake fault here and water can bubble up um, between the cracks in the rock. And um, in these wet areas here and here and here, there's a toad, a toad. It's called the Black Toad of Deep Springs Valley. And uh, it lives here and it's a toad. Now, toads do not like desert areas. They do not like aridity. They rely on water for breeding and for feeding. They're maybe a little bit more drought tolerant than frogs are, but not much. They do not often cross, we thought, between um, springs, this spring and that spring and that spring. But a friend of mine started doing genetic research and he started looking at the DNA of these toes. He took samples thinking that we have distinct populations here. I might, I might just add, there's one more spring somewhere up here. I can't find it right away, but someplace in this, this uh, mm, canyon is a spring. That bothers me. It's up there somewhere, trust me. And uh, so he took samples of these toads, and he found that, indeed, these are distinct populations of toads, which was really cool and fun to do. And you might wonder, how the heck did the toads get here to begin with? And that has something to do with the last ice ages and the climate then and when this lake was much bigger. But that's another story. I just wanted to show you a real-life uh, example of populations in nature. Um, I've seen them. I've tested them with my friend, and so I know that they're there. Okay, let's go back to our presentation here and here. Okay, Hawaii population. Okay with populations now? I hope so. The next subject is biotic community. What is a biotic community? Well, you might think a community is you and your friends and your family living in an area, and actually it's a pretty good analogy for what a biotic community is, but let's give you the real uh, ecological definition. It is an assemblage of populations of different species in a natural area. So the definition actually has three important parts you need to put together. One is the assemblage of populations of different species. So you have to know what a species is. You have to know what, a pop, what the concept population is. And then imagine a bunch of different populations of different species. And then there's a geographic component in an area. Okay, so that's a biotic community. So instead of calling it a biotic community, I will try to just call it a community from now on. We're not talking about people. We're talking about all species living in an area. Okay, so uh, what determines a community in a certain area? What determines it? What, why do some species, why are there some species there and other species are not there? Well, that is determined primarily by abiotic factors, non-living factors, such as the availability of water, presence or absence, or seasonality of it, temperature of it, the climate, the salinity, how much salt is present might be really important, the soil type. This is just a brief list. You, you could come up with lots of abiotic factors. Okay, a biotic community is named for its plants. For instance, a redwood forest or a prairie grassland, or an alder riparian zone would be a community, okay? It's named for its plants. Plants are very important. We don't call them the great buffaloes, the great buffalo area. We call it the great plains or the prairie, named after the plants, plains, sort of plant-like. Okay, so here's an important uh, concept that is bringing these words all together populations of different species within a biotic community constantly interact, interact. I really want to emphasize that. And that's why I keep saying what cycles and what flows through ecosystems, energy, chemical macronutrients, also, well, cycle within ecosystems, energy flows, photosynthesis happens, respiration, all these things that we've been talking about all this class 
um, are part of the interactions. And what are the interactions between, between organisms in a community? And those organisms in a community are composed of populations of species. Okay, so make sure you study these words and make sure you can make up sentences about these words because they all go together and I want you to understand that. If you understand that, you really understand a lot of your environment. Okay, so they constantly interact both with each other and with the abiotic environment. I, I sped up. I was too fast there. With each other so that the woodpecker pecking on a tree and eating the bugs is interacting with the tree and the bugs. Um, and they're also interacting with the abiotic environment as they breathe in oxygen, as they do photosynthesis, as they help nutrient cycle, as they shade out the understory. For, let's say a redwood tree is shading out the understory. So there's constant interaction between organisms and between the organisms and the abiotic environment. Let's put it all together again. Okay, populations of different species within a biotic community constantly interact with each other and with an abiotic environment. Okay, there's, there's my big sentence. Study it carefully, make sure you can recreate it. Okay, oh, the study of this interaction is called, all the way back to the beginning, environmental radical, no, ecology. It's called ecology. Okay, but we're not done. Two more vocabulary words, and then we're almost done. Okay, the first is habitat. Probably most people have an intuitive feeling for habitat. Here's my definition. The natural environment in which an organism lives. Okay, so the habitat for you is going to be different from the habitat of a snail. Sure, I'll come back to snails in a second. So the habitat includes the specific abiotic factors, like some things I've already mentioned, and also, biotic factors, huh, like what? Well, the availability of food if you're not a plant. So if you're not a plant, you get your food from other something else, and that's going to be another species or other kinds of species. So that is a biotic factor. The level of predation around you, uh, maybe there's not many. Yay, great, you can thrive. Or, oh, there's too many, we're all dead. And parasitism. And uh, for humans, I just put in society because none of us... No man is an island. We cannot live on our own. We need other people. That's important. And it's true for many other species, too. In fact, I think probably all other species need some level of society. Okay, so that's habitat. Uh, some examples of habitats. Uh, I'm going to give you some pictures, but before I forget, I wanted, to talk, I wanted to talk about snails because somebody put pictures of snails in their signs of spring. And uh, snails are not a sign of spring, but they're pretty cool. And I have a garden, and snails plague us gardeners. And so one of my strategies I wanted to share with you in controlling snails in my garden has to do with habitat. If you understand snail habitat and you destroy it, then you don't have to kill the snails because there won't be any there because there's no habitat for them. Uh, so what are snails like? Well, I have found that they really like dark, damp, wet places. So mm, piles of wood, bunches of rubbish. Um, I noticed once that they really liked fence posts, metal fence posts that were covered with weeds, which was great because they would all come to that. And then instead of, I couldn't get rid of the fence posts, so I would just gather the snails. They'd always go there, especially as I removed all the rest of their nice places. They would come to this one place that was nice and wet, and I would gather them up and remove them. OK, uh, my chickens like snails. Oh, here's a habitat, or uh, this is good redwood habitat. What is, makes a good redwood habitat? We'll find out. We're going to explore that, but basically the climate, the soils of redwood country. Uh, the redwoods themselves make habitat for other species, and it turns out that the uh, underneath old growth redwood uh, forest is it's very dark very shady and it's not good habitat for certain species for instance deer uh, you don't really see much big wildlife at all under redwood forest canopy I don't know why maybe it's just because the habitat there isn't good for the kind of plants that those creatures like redwood um, uh, sword fern is apparently not very palatable to a lot of species anyway okay another habitat Oh, no, we're just going to go right along to ecosystems. 
This is the last big word of today's lecture. So take a breath, make sure you're ready to go on, and we'll finish this out. What is an ecosystem? It's a nice word. We like to use this word. It's kind of fancy, isn't it? It turns out it's a really thorny word when you, when you try to look at it closely, but here's what we got. Okay, an ecosystem is an interactive complex of communities, uh, a complex of communities, many communities, and the abiotic environment affecting them within an area. Uh, okay, what this really means is ecosystems are complicated. They're not just one community, they're a number of different communities. Okay, and it's, it's an interaction. There's a lot of interaction between these communities. Why? Well, because they're in an area. They share things. Uh, maybe a river runs through it. Maybe species go back and forth between different communities. Uh, they're in the same area. Okay, and the abiotic environment. So ecosystem includes communities, organisms, and their abiotic environment. Okay? So, for instance, a forest ecosystem, a grassland, a wetland, a coral reef, or maybe even just a puddle could be considered an ecosystem if in each of these there is an interactive complex of communities, which there is in a forest. If you look at a forest, you have north-facing slopes, south-facing slopes, you have river bottoms, you might have some springs, you might have some dry areas. Maybe fire came through it, and so you have an opener area. Okay, so a forest is definitely an interactive complex of communities. And you would have to include in the forest not just the plants, as you would in the community or the organisms, um, but also the abiotic aspects of it. So the forest will have various abiotic factors associated with it. Okay? So that's ecosystem. Ecosystems, here's some of the problems with ecosystems. They, they, they lack distinct boundaries. They are not isolated. So kind of when someone says they're talking about an ecosystem, you kind of want them to define the ecosystem for you so you know what they're talking about. If they just say, ah, oh, the forest ecosystem uh, over in Wichipec, you don't really know what they're talking about, so you might want to ask them. Okay? Uh, and again, one of the... the, the things that makes the boundaries fuzzy between ecosystems is that a species can occupy multiple ecosystems and migrate between them, like a Canada geese. Canada geese migrate. Um, and sometimes they're out on the mud flats, and sometimes they're in the farmer's fields. So they occupy multiple ecosystems. So sometimes it's tricky talking about ecosystems. But go back to the original definition and make sure you understand it. Okay, An interactive complex of communities and the abiotic environment affecting them within an area. Okay, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. There's a continuous flow of energy and an exchange of nutrients or a cycling of nutrients among all the members of a community. So the woodpecker, the snail, the tree, all the members of a community are exchanging nutrients and, and transferring energy between communities, so that happens between communities, not just within communities, um, and between communities and the abiotic environment. Okay, so this is a lot of words in this slide, but I really hope you understand the words and the concepts behind them, so study it, please. I've shown you this before. Uh, it's just another picture of this uh, flowing of energy through and cycling of nutrients within now ecosystems. Okay, so I just wanted to uh, close off here by showing you a couple examples of ecosystems in which there's a flow of energy and a cycling of nutrients. I'm going to start, whoops, let's go north of I. I'm going to start in the southern hemisphere in the New World. And you've probably all heard of the uh, Brazilian, well, the tropical rainforest, uh, in, at least in, in this part of the world, South America. And you can see the darker green area, I hope. This is all tropical rainforest. It's fantastic. It's just absolutely fantastic. Hot and wet and old. And uh, unfortunately, humans are having a really rapid and strong impact on it because what we do is we build a road, which you can kind of see this line, and then people follow the road out and they start settling. And when they settle, what they do is they cut down the trees 
And this part of the world, they do slash and burn agriculture. Uh, and then the trees are gone and the soil is barren. Now, what happens in the tropical rainforest, in this part of the world at least, is that the soils are very old and it's been very hot and wet. And so what has happened to the rocks, the parent material that made up this soil? It weathered and it weathered and it weathered. And as I told you before, um, the nutrients, the phosphorus, the nitrate, the other things in that rocks it will dissolve out, will dissolve out, and over time they're lost. But if you let enough time go by, the biosphere, the communities, the ecosystems, grab what nutrients there are and lock them up in the community. So the trees, the monkeys, the squirrels, whatever, the puma, uh, the lianas, that, the orchids that live in this forest um, are constantly sharing the nutrients. They're feeding off each other and when they die those nutrients go right back into the ecosystem and they stay locked up. They really cycle tightly until something happens. Uh, for instance, in this case, humans who come by and will cut it down and what happens to the nutrients? Well, as soon as they're burned, the nutrients enter the soil um, but the soils don't have much holding capacity. The humans make a few harvests perhaps. There's some heavy rains, the nutrients are lost, and the soil becomes unproductive. And so it's really kind of a tragedy uh, that this is happening on a number of different reasons because of the loss of species, the loss of beauty, and the loss of nutrients that renders an area once incredibly diverse, uh, practically barren. And this can stay that way for a long time until the nutrients come back from somewhere. That could be a while. Okay, but it is not right to uh, uh, look at the moat in someone else's eye without paying attention to the log in one's own. And so let's take a look at our own backyard. Let's get out of South America and let's take a look at Humboldt County where a similar thing is happening, but it's working out very, very differently. So let's see, here we are in the Humboldt Bay area. And you can see I've got HSU's Redwood Bowl there. If, and if you come up north, uh, Redwood National Park is this hom relatively homogenous green area. But between Humboldt Bay and Redwood Park, you see this patchwork quilt here. And what this is, is mostly I think this is a uh, uh, green diamond timberland. It's private land that's being managed just like a cornfield. Um, they're growing plants and they're harvesting them regularly year after year. Okay, you can see all over the place that there are uh, logging areas. These are roads. Uh, that would be on a ridge top right here where this road is. Hope you can see that. And then you can see, oh, they're logging this real recently. Okay, so that's a, a recent cut. Um, and they're leaving some trees behind. They're leaving this area. They'll come back and get that later. And they'll do that year after year. And in Redwood Country, there's a lot of timberlands, land managed for the timber. Um, but how come these trees come back? They don't come back like this in the tropics. Why not? Well, in the tropics, there was all the nutrients were locked up in the biosphere. And when that was removed, the nutrients were gone. The soil did not have many nutrients in them. This soil here underneath our feet is very young. It's very new. It's much richer in nutrients. And so we are able to grow crop after crop of trees on this land. And so the foresters say trees are America's renewable resource. And in a way that's true. Um, they can cut these trees down and they will grow back. Um, some redwoods are now on probably fourth cutting. They were cut down once, twice, three times. And now the, you, they just keep coming back. Um, there's a lot of reasons for the high levels of nutrients. And I mentioned that it's because the soils are young. But as I mentioned previously also, uh, all this land is being fertilized or has in the past been fertilized by salmon. Salmon going out into the ocean which is rich in nutrients and then swimming their nutrients up the stream and after they breed they die and they're fed upon. So this is 
uh, a, a nutrient pump fueled by salmon, which is one of the most amazing concepts. And then once the nutrients are here on the riverbank or in the river, uh, the bear feed on them, the raccoons and everybody, the birds feed on them. They, now the nutrients are in the bear and the bear goes out and transports nutrients into the forest and poops and dies. And now it's a continuous fertilization of this ecosystem by um, salmon originally. That's cool. Okay, so that's an example of um, a really cool aspect of this ecosystem and it explains why we can continue to have multiple crops of trees over generations and generations, whereas it doesn't work so well in the tropical rainforest. Okay, folks, that's, uh, I think that's it. I don't think there's any more PowerPoint. Nope, there isn't. And so I hope you enjoy the presentation. Make sure you look at the words of the day, study this. We've put it all together. Soon what we'll be doing is looking at specific habitats within Redwood Country. So look forward to that. Adios.